What can we learn by reflecting on Hesiod's works and days? This work was well known and quoted by the ancient Greeks and was likely composed about the same time as Homer's poems. What does works and days tell us about Greek culture and Greek religion? Are the maxims of Hesiod an early form of Stoicism? How do they compare to Judeo-Christian morality and to the maxims in the book of Proverbs? Please, we welcome interesting questions in the comments. Let us learn and reflect together. At the end of our talk, we'll discuss the sources used for this video. Please feel free to follow along in the PowerPoint script we uploaded the slideshare. The works of Hesiod may have been composed about the same time as the poems of Homer around the end of the 8th century BC. And our translator has a humorous description of Hesiod. He is a grouchy old farmer who mistrusts lords but does not advocate changing the society. He believes in justice, honesty, and conventional piety, self-reliance, self-denial, foresight, and above all, work. He dislikes city folk, the sea, women, gossip, and laziness. He delivers a maxim like, don't urinate where the sun can see you, with the same earnest conviction that he advises judges not to take bribes, his brother to avoid pride, and the farmer to get two nine-year-old oxen in a 40-year-old hired hand. Hesiod mixes moral maxims with maxims on how to run a farm during the planting, growing, and harvesting season emphasizing the hard back-breaking work and dedication needed to run a small farm in ancient Greece. Does he exhibit a Stoic mentality? Perhaps, but that can be said of any work that prominently includes moral maxims. Like many later Stoic philosophers, he mostly refers to Zeus as if he were a monotheistic god dispensing justice and encouraging virtue. Although it would be more accurate to say that this is a henotheistic belief system, since Zeus seems to be the embodiment of all the gods. Hesiod's works and days begins with Pyrian muses, bringers of fame, come tell of your father Zeus and sing his hymn. With ease he strengthens any man, with ease he makes the strong man humble, and with ease he levels mountains and exalts the plain, withers the proud and makes the crooked straight. Does this sound familiar? Luke 3 quotes Isaiah when it describes how John the Baptist, the forerunner, prepared the path for Jesus. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Here it is. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. Is there a connection between these verses in Hesiod and Isaiah? Or perhaps they're drawing from a common Mesopotamian saying? They are dissimilar enough that it could just be coincidence. Scholars doubt that the ancient Greeks were aware of the Jewish scriptures, especially since they are likely oral tradition at the time of Hesiod. But we know so little about the ancient world, perhaps there was more awareness of the surrounding cultures than scholars have discovered. Strife is no only child. Upon the earth two strifes exist. Their natures differ. For the cruel one makes battles thrive in war and she wins no love. But the other strife urges even lazy men to work. A man grows eager, seeing another rich, from plowing, planting, and ordering his house. So neighbor vies with neighbor in the rush for wealth. This strife is good for mortal men. Potter hates potter, carpenters compete, and beggar strives with beggar and bard with bard. Later on he does condemn covetousness. Hesiod tells us the tale of the races of men, first the golden race. Like the gods they lived with happy hearts, untouched by work or sorrow. Wild old age never appears, but always lively limb, far from all ills, they feasted happily. This race was hidden in the ground, but still they live as spirits in the earth, holy and good, guardians who keep off harm. This golden race is also mentioned by Ovid and Plato, but they are succeeded by the silver and bronze races of men, and each race is lesser than its predecessor. And this is similar to the race of giants in Genesis, the Nephilim. And this is the verse in Genesis. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward, when the sons of God come into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. They were the mighty men that were of old, the men of renown. Now this verse is a puzzle to scholars, and many posit that this is from very ancient sources indeed. Hesiod continues, These are followed by a godlike race of men who were called the demigods, race before our own. Foul wars and dreadful battles ruined some. This was the noble race of men who fought in the Trojan War many who had both divine and mortal parents. Then, foreseeing Zeus, made another race, the fifth, who now live upon the fertile earth. 
I wish I were not of this race, that I had died before or had not yet been born. This is the race of iron. Now by day men work and grieve unceasingly. By night they waste away and die. The gods will give harsh burdens and will mingle in some good. And the current fifth race of iron will break all of the commandments. They won't honor their parents. They will slander and steal and murder and they will envy. And he see continues. Their brother love of past days will be gone. Men will dishonor parents who grow old too quickly and will blame and criticize with cruel words. Wretched and godless, they refusing to repay their bringing up, will cheat the aged parents of their due. And men will destroy the towns of other men. The just, the good, the man who keeps his word will be despised, but men will praise the bad and insolent. Might will be right and shame will cease to be. Men will do injury to better men by speaking crooked words and adding lying oaths everywhere. So this may be the origin of the phrase, might will be right. Eseed continues, Everywhere harsh voice and sullen faced and loving harm, envy will walk along with wretched men. Last to Olympus before the broad path to earth, hiding their loveliness in robes of white, to join the gods, abandoning mankind, will go the spirit's righteousness and shame. And only grievous troubles will be left for me and no defense against our wrongs. And our translator's footnote says this, Shame perhaps should be called honor or sense of shame. He see it in Homer lived in what anthropologists call a shame culture as opposed to a guilt culture like ours. And the chief reason for good behavior in a shame culture is what other people will think. Thus, shame is a good goddess. And this is seen in the classic Greek epic, The Iliad. Although I think it would be more accurate to say that shame overrode guilt in ancient warrior cultures, and that guilt overrides shame in modern judicial cultures. But in both there's a mix. One of our overriding themes is we must understand that all ancient cultures were warrior cultures out of necessity. There were no policemen in ancient times. You had to defend your own honor. And all citizens had to defend their city to prevent its destruction and the slaying of all its military age men, and to prevent the enslavement of women and children. But Hesiod longs for justice, says the Socrates so many decades later. O oh, Perses, follow right, control your pride. For pride is evil in a common man, even a noble finds it hard to bear. It weighs him down and leads him to disgrace. The road to justice is the better way, for justice in the end will win the race and pride will lose. The simpleton must learn this fact through suffering. But there are some who till the fields of pride and work at evil deeds. Zeus marks them out. And often all the city suffers for their wicked schemes. And on these men from heaven, the son of Kronos sends great punishments. Both plague and famine, and the people die. And the terrors of the plague are mentioned in the opening chapters of the Iliad. During their raids on the allied cities of Troy, the Greek carried off many of their young maidens as concubines. King Agamemnon won the young girl Chryseis, while King Achilles won the beauty Briseis. Chryseis, father of Chryseis, and priest Apollo alone, unarmed in broad daylight, confidently strives into the armed camp of the Achaeans, seeking to ransom his daughter Chryseis. And the Greeks are awed by the courage of Chryseis, but Agamemnon commits an act of hubris by disrespecting the brave Chryseis. And the god Apollo sends a calamitous plague to punish Agamemnon for his hubris and for his lack of respect for a priest of Apollo. The plague was a constant scourge in the ancient world, and it often spread when those who lived in the country crowded behind the city walls during a military siege. For example, in the beginning of the Peloponnesian War, the plague that swept through crowded conditions behind the walls killed a quarter of the Athenian citizens. And he see it saying, The eyes of Zeus sees all and understands. And when he wished, marks and does not miss how just the city is inside. And I would not myself be just, nor have my son be just among bad men. For it is bad for an honest man to be where felons rule. And this is a lesson that Lot, brother of Abraham, learns when he and his family flees the wicked city of Sodom. Remember, Abraham is asking the Almighty whether he will destroy the righteous along with the wicked. He first asks if he will save the city if fifty righteous are found. Then he asks 45, and then for 30, and then for 20. But he stops when the Almighty says he will save the city for the sake of 10 righteous men. Why does he stop at 10? Simply put, already at 10, Abraham sees that some of Lot's extended family is not among the righteous. And some advice offered by Hesiod conflicts with Christian virtue, although similar verses can be found in Proverbs. Hesiod says this on hard work, O noble Perses, keep my words in mind and work till hunger is your enemy. Hunger always loves a lazy man. 
both men and gods despise him, for he is much like the stingless drone, who does not work but eats and wastes the efforts of the bees. This overriding emphasis on the value of hard work, to the exclusion of charity, is a theme we also see in the original Pinocchio, where our puppet, after a long exhausting swim across the sea, finds himself on the shore of the land of industrious bees. In work there is no shame, shame is an idleness, and if you work, the lazy man will soon envy your wealth. The rich man can become famous and good. Now is greed always good? Many in our modern culture promote greed. Our motivational speakers urge us to paste pictures of the fancy cars and mansions we will buy once we become rich, so we must work hard. Hard work is indeed good. We're expected to provide for our family and save a nest egg for retirement and emergencies. But Hesiod does not say a word about being generous to our neighbor, about giving alms and taking care of the poor. Now in contrast, Proverbs has many verses exhorting us to take care of the poor, to be kind to the poor, but just a few verses urging hard work and industry. As in Proverbs 11, How long will you lie there, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? Little sleep, little slumber, a little folding of hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a vagabond, and wants like an armed man. And Hesiod observes that it's better to be rich than to be poor. A cringing humbleness accompanies the needy man, a humbleness which may destroy or profit him. The humble are the poor men, while the rich are self-assured. But Hesiod warns, If a man gets wealth by force of hands or through his lying tongue, and shame is pushed aside by shamelessness, then the gods blot him out and blast his house, and soon his wealth deserts him. But wealth does not necessarily indicate the goddess blessed you, In Proverbs 13 agrees. Wealth hastily gotten will dwindle, but he who gathers little by little will increase it. He see it condemns fraud, but he does not seek to love his enemies. Shun evil profit for dishonest gain is just the same as failure. Love your friends. Give to him who gives, but not if he does not. We give to generous men, but no one gives to stingy ones. Give is a lovely girl, but grab is bad, and she only gives death. The man who gives ungrudgingly is glad at heart, rejoicing in his gift. But if a man forgets his shame and takes something, however small, his heart grows stiff and cold. And this is a classic quote by Hesiod that is repeated in Proverbs. Don't let a woman wiggling her behind and flattering and coaxing take you in. She wants your bar. This woman is just a cheat. And although I might add, in most of the verses that are similar in Proverbs, he's talking about prostitutes. And Hesiod has much advice on how to run a farm in the ancient world, plus maxims on hard work. But don't put off work until another day, or even till tomorrow. Lazy men who put things off always have unfilled barns. Constant attention makes the work go well. Idlers wrestle with ruin all their days. And he continues, Good habits are a man's finest friend, and bad habits are his worst enemy. And this is a comment that the Christian monastics would be fond of. And he see it comes on, The idle man who lives on empty hope and has no way to earn his living turns his mind to crime. Hope is not good for him who sits and gossips when he has no job. Now in ancient Greece, men married late to girls young enough to train. This is what Hesiod says. Bring home a wife when you're ripe for it. When you're 30, not much more or less. That's the proper age for marrying. Your wife should have matured four years before. and Marry in the fifth year. She should always be a virgin. So you must teach her sober ways. And he's saying that because Greek women married when they were teenagers. Half their husband's age. You see it notes, no prize is better than a worthy wife. A bad one makes you shiver with the cold. The greedy wife will roast her man alive without the aid of fur, although he is quite tough. She'll bring him to a raw old age. And there are very few paintings of Greek husbands and wives, but this is one of them. And there are some stories of Socrates having two wives, and here's one tormenting him. In Proverbs 31 is dedicated to the good wife, and we'll only provide the opening verses. A good wife, who can find? She is more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her. She will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. Now in ancient Greece, aristocracy meant rule of the best and was preferred by many. Socrates, Plato, and Xenophon were wary of direct democracy. Hesiod thus warns us, don't be called too hospitable, not yet unfriendly. Don't be talked of as too fond of lower class companions or as one who likes to pick fight with noblemen. But he see it also warns against abusing the poor, possibly because as a farmer he was not an aristocrat. Never reproach a man for poverty, which eats the heart out and destroys, for it is given by the blessed deathless gods. A man's best treasure is a thrifting tongue. 
his most appealing gift, a tongue that moves with moderation. For if you should speak slander, you'll soon hear worse about yourself. And Proverb 14 notes that the poor is disliked even by his neighbor, but the rich has many friends. He who despises his neighbor is a sinner, but happy is he who is kind to the poor. And he who oppresses a poor man insults his maker, but he who is kind to the needy honors him. And he see does not the concern with being kind to the poor, especially he is not concerned with giving alms to the poor. Curiously, he see it bids us to be reverent to the gods in this manner. Do not make water standing toward the sun, and when you travel, do not urinate upon the road or near it. And later he cautions against peeing in a spring. The ancient Greeks likely thought that this was wise advice, since they believed that the gods and spirits reside in springs and rivers and everywhere. All of the ancients are somewhat pantheistic. And gossip can easily lead to slander, as Hesiod notes. Avoid gossip which is wicked. Gossip is not hard to raise. She is light, but burdensome to bear, and hard to unload when you must carry her. Gossip is hard to kill when many men support her. She is rather like a god, the most mischievous god. And these are the ending verses of Hesiod's works and days. He is truly blessed and rich who knows these things and does his work, guiltless before the gods and scrupulous, observing omens and avoiding wrong. Now we'll discuss the sources used for this video. Our translator doubts that works and days and theogony were composed by the same man, although they are both attributed to Hesiod. The theogony is simply a compilation of myths about the gods and creation and contains very few moral lessons. The translator says that the writing style for the two works differ too much. He found the theogony difficult to translate, while the works and days were a joy to translate. And we likewise found this translation by Dorothea A. Wender, the translator, was a joy to read. There were hundreds of medieval manuscripts for Hesiod's works and days. These derived from three families of manuscripts, with many ancient manuscripts in each family, which is a decent number for ancient works though not as numerous as the manuscripts of the Platonic Dialogues. Included in this volume is the Theognis, which is a mediocre work that scholars can consult for clues about Greek culture. But Theognis himself is a bitter man, angry at how life has robbed him of his fortune. And this work does not contain many useful moral teachings. The YouTube description includes a link to our PowerPoint script that we uploaded to SlideShare and also our blog. Please support this channel by sharing this video with your friends and by clicking on the like and subscribe buttons and by clicking on the Amazon links to purchase any of the books we discussed, which will earn us a very small affiliate commission. And please consider becoming a patron of our channel. Plus, we will host special discussion groups for our patrons. Plus, you can click on the meetup or small M icon to participate in our online discussions where we practice our future YouTube scripts. And please click on the links for other videos that will broaden your knowledge and improve your soul.